Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Hi. Well, did you see him? Yeah, I just came from there. Spent an hour in the chair. Did he pull it? No, he thinks he can save it. He says the nerve's dead. He says I must have hit it against something recently, you know, cup and coke bottle or something like yeah. that. When the nerve dies like that, the gas forms in the tooth, and that's what caused all the pain. Well, he drilled a little hole in the back and he let the gas out and felt better right away. It was still sore, but a whole lot better. Uh, what happens now? Well, he packed it with cotton, and in a day or two, he'll take the nerve out and then fill it up. Oh. Hello, Lieutenant. Oh, Mr. Corbett, how are you? You know Sergeant Quine? How do you do, sir? Fine. Nice to see you again. I got your call, Lieutenant. You pick up that fellow I saw in the picture? Yes. Kind of thought that's what it was about. You want to take one of those seats over there, Mr. Corbett? I'll be right with you. Uh, Sure. Uh, Will this take very long? Uh, How many, Quine? Uh, uh, 28. Uh, Not too long. Half an hour or so. Uh, My wife said she'd be here at 9 to pick me up. Oh, you'll be out by then. Uh, Okay. Uh, By the pillar? That's right. Any chair is okay. Hostler, come in. Yeah, a few minutes ago. He's with Myers in the front row. Then Mrs. Benfield and John Rice are over on his side. Uh-huh. Uh, Sam Gilbert and John LeWine couldn't get in. Well, we might have enough with Osler, Benfield, and Rice. Yeah, might. Okay, see you. Yep. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? My, I just made it. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of the line, when asked for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. Now, the questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. Keep it moving, boys, to the end of the stage, all the way. Now, turn and face the front, hands at your sides. When I call your number, step out to the circle and talk up. It's a big room out there. I want everybody to hear you. All right, number one, Norman Boring, open charge. Step out, Norman. Where do you live? 2555 East Mariposa Street. You'll have to speak up, Norman. Try it again. Talk it as loud as I can. Repeat your address. 2555 East Mariposa Street. I don't feel so good. You're doing fine. Where do you work? No place. Well, what kind of work do you do? Tire shop. I change tires. You aren't working now? No. Why, Norman? Because I'm here, I guess. How can I work when I'm in the pokey? <laughs> Want to take your hands out of your pockets? Uh, oh, yeah. Did you work any place before you came here? No. I see. You own a car? Yeah. Buick, Ford, Chevrolet, what? Hmm? Huh? What kind of car? 33 Dodge Cezanne. I don't feel so good. I ought to be in a hospital. We'll have the doctor look you over. Step back. Okay. Number two, Robert Goff. Grand Theft Auto. Where do you live, Robert? Do you hear me, Robert? My name ain't Goff. It's Armand. It says here that it's Goff. Robert Goff. My name's Robert Armand. A-R-M-I-N. Chief of Police in Walla Walla, Washington thinks your name's Goff. He has your fingerprints on file up there. What's that? He has your fingerprints on file up there. Well, I can't understand that. Something must have gotten mixed up. I've never been in Walla Walla, Washington. We'll try to straighten it out. When were you picked up? It was the night before that. Any weapons? Oh, no. Did you have a car? No. What about the 46 Packard? Well, I was just sitting there. I wasn't driving it or anything. Didn't you have a key in the ignition? Who, me? You. Oh, no. I was just sitting there when the officers came up to me. Is it your car? No. At four o'clock in the morning, you were just sitting around in someone else's car? I was cold. (laughs) Well, I was. Okay, Robert, slide on down. Number three, Claude Yeager, robbery. Your address, Claude? 213 North 66th Street. Don't look at me. Look out there through the screen. Is that an apartment house, hotel, or what? Apartment house. That way you were arrested? Yeah. 
Speak right up. What do you do, Claude? I sell clothes. I work for Brockman's men's clothes. How long you worked there? Four months. Sergeant Carger. Yeah. We have a profile on this man. Now move up under the light, Claude. Yeah. Now do a quarter turn. Mm. No, no, a full quarter turn. All right. That's it. Now another one. Once more. Now front. Hey, what is this? Never mind. No visible scars. Mole high on left cheek. Thank you, Sergeant. Hold out number three for interrogation. Okay, Claude, step over there. Lieutenant, mm -hmm. that's right, my man. Number, four. Huh? number three, number that's three. the one I saw in the mug picture. Benfield and John Rice identified Jager too. His card. Yeah, that makes three. Have a chance to get a rundown on him yet? Yeah. Ammo matches with these other drugstore jobs. Package came a couple of minutes ago. Uh, Claude Jaeger, alias Carl Young, alias Charles Human. Narcotic violation, 1941, six months county jail. Armed robbery conviction, 1946, got out six months ago. Mm. Parole? Yeah, he's registered. Parole officer says he's been doing pretty well. Got the job at the men's store about four months ago. People at the store don't know about him. Central robbery... But... No, I'll get it. Sergeant Klein. The other. That's all. Okay, great. Right. Bye. Asher, Ben. Just left Gilburn and Lowine. They make him? Yep. In the mug shots. How about Jaeger's place? And Kendall and Murph out there now. Okay, let me know. Yep. You got any matches, Ben? No, I think so. Yeah, here. Thanks. You want one of these, Claude? No, thanks. You, uh, know why you're being held, Claude? Quite a build-up. Dragging a guy out of his place of work, sticking him in a lineup. What are they going to think down at the store? Well, they talk pretty nice about you at the store, Claude. Yeah, but what about now? What about after all this? I'll get canned, that's what'll happen. And just because you guys can't think anybody else to pick up. In the last ten days, six different drug stores have been held up by a single man. Over $1,200 has been taken. All the victims of these holdups have gone through our mug book of parolees previously convicted for armed robbery. Five of them have identified your picture as the man who held them up. I don't know nothing about any drugstore holdups. Tonight, three of these victims picked you right out of the lineup. Crazy people. We want to know how you've been spending your nights, Claude. Let's start with Monday. Where were you? I was home. I went fishing during the day, got home about 7 o'clock, and went to bed. That's where I was. Don't you work on Mondays? My day off. Where'd you go fishing? Piedmont Pier. Rent a boat, did you? No, right off the pier. Uh, anybody with you? No. Catch any fish? No. But you came home early and went to bed, is that it? That's it. Can you prove any of this? Who proves they went fishing? I'm How about you... Friday night, Claude? Saturday's a big day. I went to bed early again. What do you mean by early, Claude? Early, just early. Nine o'clock, ten, one. Before ten. Can you prove it? Look, I don't know, I don't know, I haven't tried. I was alone. How can I prove I was in bed? Anybody see you come in your place or call you? No, no, I don't. Well, maybe the landlady saw me come in. She sees everything. Mm. How about last Wednesday night, Claude? Wednesday? Mm. I don't know. Who remembers what Think, they do? Think, Claude, this is important to you. Yeah, sure it is. But I can't remember what I do every night in the week. Well, you remembered what you did Monday night. You remembered what you did Friday night. Try Wednesday. Monday, I was off. Friday's always the same with me. Try, Claude. I went to a movie. Where? The Rialto over on Grand Street. They had bank night. That's Wednesdays. I saw Singing in the Rain. Mm -hmm. What time did you go to the movie? The second show, uh, 8.30 or 9, I guess. And what time did you get out? Way after midnight, probably one, the double feature. Look, I was there all right. I can tell you all about With the... With somebody, were you? Yeah. I took a girl from the store, cashier, name of Alice Westering. You can ask her. We had dinner together, and then we went to the movie. And how'd you go? We walked. She had her car, but she left it in a lot. And you say you got out close to one? That's right. And then what? We went back, got her car, and she drove me home. After one o'clock? Yeah. How do you know? Because I was beat. And I had to get up at 7 the next day. Those double features kill me. It was the last show. Look, what's so hot about Wednesday? Last holdup was Wednesday, Claude. About 11 o'clock. 
Anybody see you come home Wednesday night? I don't know. Look, you guys, call up Alice. She'll tell you. We were out to the movie and didn't get home till one or better. See her. She'll tell you. Okay, Claude. We will. with the store manager, Ben. She's on the main floor here. He's sent in the back. Yeah. Stop in on your way? Yeah. Quine's still working on him. Jaeger's landlady wasn't much help either way. Small talk to her. Does he have a locker or something like that here in the store? No. I'd like to find a Luger and 1200 bucks, huh? Yeah. Hey, P. Hmm? Good looking. Yeah. I could use a couple of dozen shirts, too. <laughs> Me, too. Yes, I love you, I. Uh, pardon me, uh, we're looking for Alice Westering. Oh, well, that's my name. A uh, police officer's like to talk to you. Do you have a few minutes? Yeah, sure. Uh, just a minute till I get this thing out of the way. Uh, take your time. Okay. Oh, why don't we go back there? I can sneak a smoke. Fine. <sighs> I don't know whether it's hotter there or hotter here. Did you, uh... Like one of these? Oh, no, thanks. I'll use my own. Hmm, here you go. <sighs> you hear about poor Claude, huh? That's right. Mr. Conklin told me he'd been picked up. Poor guy. Well, what's he done? You gonna have to go back to jail? We're just checking up on a few things, Miss Westering. Maybe you can help us. How long have you known Claude Yeager? Ever since he started selling clothes here. Two, three, four months, I guess. I never knew he was a con until Mr. Conklin told me yesterday. I never tell, you know. But that didn't make no difference to me. Claude's been pretty nice. You know, nothing wrong. Hope he doesn't have to go back. What are you holding him for? He take you out much, did he? Oh, you know, lunch sometimes, dinner. You know, we kind of hit it off. Of course, him having a criminal record and all that sort of changes things. I wasn't serious about him or anything like that, but he's taken up some of my time, you know. Well, just how much have you been seeing him? Hmm. Once, twice a week, maybe. What do you do when you go out? Well, not much. He told me he couldn't drive a car that he never learned, and that's why he didn't have one. Well, that sounds funny, but I guess it's because he's on parole and isn't allowed to have a car for a while or something. We'd take my car. I got a nice car. My brother-in-law sold it to me, 49.4. It's pretty nice. Claude and I'd ride around in that, go to a drive-in or something, movies, you know. Uh, when was the last time you were out with him? Well, let's see. I think it was Tuesday. We went bowling. At the last time? Huh? You sure about that? Well, now, let me think a minute. Oh, wait. We went to a movie last Wednesday. Had some dinner and went to the Rialto together. It was a good picture. It was singing Early night. or late show? Well, we had some dinner down the street and went right to the show. Got in right in the middle of the newsreel. You know what time it was? Well, it was still light out when we got there, so it couldn't have been more than 7, 7.30. What time did you get out of the movie? Oh, 10, maybe. I had to be in early. I lived with my aunt. Uh, wasn't it a double feature? Yeah. Well, it seems it'll take a little more time than that to see a double feature, Miss Westring. Three hours? Oh, well, we only stayed for one picture. We were out by 10. <laughs> Let's see if there's anything on the book, Pete. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> ben. Hmm? Small found a deposit slip in Yeager's apartment. Banked $830 this week. Wow. Oh, what does he make at that store? $48.50 a week, plus commissions. He's never had better than a $300 month. Let's get him up here. All right. Hi, Ben. Hi. Hello, Quinn. Well, 211 just came. Drugstore. M.O. and description, same as the other jobs. Luger and everything. Well, be. What do you think, Ben? I think we're holding the wrong man. Political history is being made in Chicago. And every day this week, the CBS radio network brings you complete convention coverage, plus a special hour and a quarter of convention highlights. Listen to Lowell Thomas, Convention Digest, with transcribed excerpts of highlight speeches of the day, Alastair Cook, brilliant correspondent of the Manchester Guardian, and Edward R. Murrow. Don't miss this special hour and a quarter of convention roundups by radio's greatest news team, 
on the CBS Radio Network. Guthrie, Cargo, 17th Precinct. You answer the call? Yes, sir. I'm Mally, Unit 32J. Who's your partner, Mally? Irving. He's in back of the store with the owner, Charles Rasmussen. Uh, any witnesses? No, not so far. Mr. Rasmussen was standing in for the regular clerk. He's here with the owner. Oh, no clerk here. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, Oh, Mr. Rasmussen said the holdup man stumbled when he started out of the store, smashed into the glass case right over there and broke it. Blood, Ben. Yeah. Mr. Rasmussen says the man cut himself on the hand and the leg somewhere. Jagged edges here, Ben. You better call the crime lab and ask them to send somebody out. I might have a print. Yes, sir. I'll watch it. Yeah. Oh, you Irving? Yeah, that's right. Guthrie Cargo, 17. Yes, sir. This is Mr. Rasmussen. Hello, Mr. Rasmussen. How do you do? Can I see that, Irving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 940, huh? Yeah. That's when the call came through, three blocks away. You notified the police right away, Mr. Rasmussen? Oh, no. I wanted to, but that boy looked mean to me. He said to wait five minutes before I moved or he'd come back and kill me. I wait. Did you notice if he was on foot or had a car outside? I couldn't say. I just know he was here taking my dough. Mm -hmm. You mind telling us exactly what happened, Mr. Rasmussen? Well, I was behind the cigar counter when he came in. Nobody else in the store. At first, I didn't see it. He asked for a package of cigarettes, and then I saw it. The gun. He was holding it in his hand close to his side, just letting it hang there, pointed at the floor. He said he wanted all the money I had here. I emptied the register by the cigar counter, then he made me go back and empty the prescription register. He just wanted the bills. Mm, I see. When I had it all together, he made me hang on to them. I mean, when I took them out of the front register, and then back here, why, he walked around the counter and stood right next to me and told me to count it. Was he pointing the gun at you? No. Same thing. Just kept it hanging by his side. People on the street could have seen him and never guessed what was going on. Mm-hmm. Well, I counted the bills, and it came to $68. I don't know whether I was counting it right or not. Then he said, let's get all of it. I asked him what he meant, and he said, I had more money around here, and I better get it up. Did you have any more? Tomorrow's deposit, $316. I stash it above the door there. Uh, was it in a bank sack? Yes, he made me take it out, count it, and hand it to him. He put it all in his pocket. Mm. Ever seen this man before? I don't think I ever did, no. I think you'd know him if you saw him again. <laughs> I'd know him anywhere. Can you add anything to this description you gave the officers, Mr. Rasmussen? No, I... Uh, uh, let's see, he's about my height, a little heavier build, wore a dark gray flannel suit, white shirt, striped tie, with a good dresser. Mm -hmm. I'd say he was in his late 30s or early 40s. Nice looking, didn't look like a hold-up man. His, uh, his eyes? No, I can't think. They were probably brown because he was dark. I didn't notice. Anything outstanding? I didn't notice anything. Mm. Uh, how about when he smashed the counter out there? Well, he sort of went down. I, I, I didn't make a move because he still had that gun hanging in his hand. I think he was cut pretty bad. Mm. Might have hit an artery on that leg. His pants got soaked right away. He made me hand him some bandages and tape and things. Yeah, uh, this gun he had, uh, you say it was a Luger? Yes, sir, a German Luger. I was in the European theater and I'd seen lots of them. I could smell the oil on it. He's one of those babies who sits up nights taking it apart and polishing it. I could just tell by the look in his eye. Now, how's that? Well, he was just aching for a chance to try it out on me. There's an empty slot. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. What's that? All right next to the mayor's car. Oh, that thing. <laughs> Don't you wish you had it? Charlie has lamps too, is not he? Too soon? Yeah, yeah, I guess he does. Looks like a dope or something. Yeah, me too. Hey, Ben. Hey. Quine. Yeah. What do you want to do about Jaeger, Ben? Yeah, he explained that bank deposit? Yeah, well, no one here. He said an aunt of his in Milwaukee died and left him the money. Mm -hmm. You check it out? Yeah, she died. Meet <laughs> <laughs> me too, too. Well, you can release him tomorrow. Isn't the first time we've had one blow up right in our faces? Yeah. Well, we have to start all over. 
Quine, get those mugs out and try to get those victims down here again to start looking them over. Rasmussen said he'd be down first thing in the morning. Okay. I'd like to have a detail out there to canvas that neighborhood. Maybe there's a witness around somewhere. Auto records might have something on a stolen car around me tonight. My arm. Must have used a car. Yeah. Well, we're going to have something to eat. Okay, Brown. I'll see you later. Yeah. Yeah. How's your little tooth, huh? Mm-hmm. Better every minute. Yeah, I sure hurt for a while. Eh? Funny thing. How do you suppose it happened? I've been trying to think. Might have been a handball game. How do I know? Just one of those. Things. Yeah. After you. Two special? Yep. Uh, maybe two. More solid mm. Yeah, I guess so. Hearts of lettuce. Mm-hmm. How about you, Ben? Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Hello. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hello. Hello. Oh, yeah, just hear me. Hold on. Ben. Quine. For you. Thanks. Hello, Quine. Hi, Ben. A man named Renfro runs the motel in Alvada. Said a man checked in the night bleeding pretty bad. Had cuts on his arms and one leg. Renfro got sore about the blood all over the place and complained about it when the guy was trying to fix himself up in the room. Said he'd been in an accident. Description's pretty close to our boy. Yeah. He left there about half an hour ago. Renfro got his license number. Motor vehicle's checking it out. Right on earth. No routine. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Well, I guess so. Oh, come in. Thank you. Okay. Would you like to sit down? I don't want to take up a lot of your time, Mrs. Palmer. I know it's late. You own a black Ford Coupe 49, license number uh, 2F40657? Mm-hmm. Yes, I guess so. I suppose that's my license number. Something wrong? Just trying to straighten out a little matter we're investigating, Mrs. Palmer. Have you been using that car lately? Of course. I use it practically every day. Did you drive it tonight? Yes, I drove home. Downtown till after seven. Now, does your husband use the car? No, we're not married anymore. We've been divorced five years. What time did you get home tonight, Mrs. Palmer? I don't know. After dinner, eight, maybe later. Am I in trouble? I have a right to know. No, about eight. No later than that. I... Look... I've lived here for 18 years. I've managed this apartment building almost that long. People know me all over town. I just won't tell you another thing until I know what's going on. Well, Mrs. Palmer, we think your car was used by a man who held up a drugstore tonight. The most ridiculous thing I ever heard. Yes, ma'am, but we checked out the registration. I don't care what you did. My car's in the garage downstairs. I brought it in before 8 o'clock. It's still there. Bernie saw me bring it in. He'll tell Who's you. Who's Bernie, Mr. Palmer? Bernie Johnson. He works in the garage, takes care of the cars. Now, I'm not going to answer any more foolish questions. Bernie's still around the garage? Not this time of night. No, of course not. I can give you his phone number and address. You can call him and ask him. He'll tell you. Okay. Here. Here, right here. Glass in four, two, three, five, six. That's in Park Hill. One seven two zero six. Just say you die. Bernie Johnson. Four two three five six one seven two zero six. You think Bernie uh, might have used your car? Of course not. Look, my car's right downstairs in the garage. I'll take you down and show you. Well, there's no need to do that, Miss Palmer. If you tell us, we'll find our way. Here. Do you see the door marked exit? Well, let's see here. Right down into the garage. Thank you. My car is in the first stall. Oh, there's a light switch to your left when you open the door. Well, thank you. Well, if you'll wait a minute, I'll get my coat. That's and... all right, Miss Palmer. Well. Hmm. I suppose she gets to these places. Two fifty at least. Hmm. That's the one. No, I just got the stairway. That did it. Yeah. Hmm. 
Cadillac, though. Yeah. Hey, there it is, then. 2F4657. Come on. Radiator's still warm, but... Now, look at this. There. All right, Joe. Hold it up there. We're police. Where'd he go? He ducked in between those cars. Hey. Okay. You haven't got a chance. He's tagged. Yeah, come on. Well, I didn't do it very smart, mister. How's it look, then? Neck, chest. Better phone in for an ambulance. Yeah. Bernard Johnson, that's your name? Hey, Ben. Yeah? Yeah. Here's the Luger. Uh-huh. He did want to use it at that. The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when asked for the question... The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie with Jack Moyle as Sergeant Pete Carger, was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Hi Everback, Parley Bear, Herb Ellis, Howard McNear, Bert Holland, and Virginia Gregg. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. You mystery fans have a triple date for mystery and adventure every Thursday night on CBS Radio. Be sure to be with us every Thursday for Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, the FBI in Peace and War, and Mr. Chameleon. Thrillers 3, packed tight with action and tension. Remember Thursday nights on most of these same CBS radio stations. And don't forget, Lowell Thomas and Edward R. Murrow are two of the noted newsmen covering the presidential conventions in Chicago over the CBS Radio Network.